Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship on a rainy, stormy morning, but you know, we need the rain, and so it's good to get it, uh, even if it is on the weekend. Um, today, the worship service, because of the scheduled scripture lessons, will be about prayer. So keep that in mind as you hear the lessons read, as some of the prayers are prayed, and the hymns are sung. Lots of reference to prayer, and Vicar will talk more about it in the sermon. The liturgy that we'll use is inserted in your hymnal on a piece of paper. On the first page of that insert is today the first hymn, This Is My Father's World. So fish that out, and then say good morning to someone in your general vicinity that dodged some raindrops or got hit by them on the way into worship. Thanks for coming. God bless your worship. stand. In the name of God the Father, praise to our creating God. In the name of God the Son, praise to our Redeemer Jesus Christ. In the name of God the Holy Spirit, praise to our renewing, faith-giving God. Amen. Lord of heaven and earth, you made all things beautiful. You have provided green forests and great lakes. You have arranged the orderly procession of day and night for our work and rest. We thank you for the morning mist and the blazing sunset, for all the joys of summer in this part of your world. Thank you for our cities and our countryside, for farms and factories, for streets and highways, and for all of life that flows so swiftly before us. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for his coming to us in word and sacraments, for his giving and forgiving, and for accepting our worship and praise. Let us pray. O Lord, 
Your ears are always open to the prayers of your humble servants who come to you in Jesus' name. Teach us always to ask according to your will, that we may never fail to obtain the blessings you have promised. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. In the prayer we just prayed, we asked God to help us pray according to his will so that we would get the blessings that he promised. There's the answer to why when you pray for winning the lottery or something like that, which isn't bad to pray for, you might not get it because it's not according to his will. Well, how do we know what God's will is? In little things that he gives us a choice, I don't know. But in what his word says, it's crystal clear. Abraham, in today's first lesson, is an example of praying boldly according to God's will. He appeals to a quality of God. If he knows God wants to be gracious, that's who he is. And on the basis of that, he's very bold. It almost sounds like he's dealing and bargaining with God. But he's praying according to God's will. And God answers that prayer, and he will answer our prayers too when we pray according to his will. Genesis chapter 18, starting with verse 20. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous, I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. And the two with him turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. And Abraham approached the Lord and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. And Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five people? If I find 45 there, the Lord said, I will not destroy it. Once again, Abraham spoke with the Lord. What if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? And he answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then Abraham said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? The Lord answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. This is the word of the Lord. The second lesson tells us that we have been given the fullness of Christ by his death on the cross. We read from Colossians 2, starting with verse 6. <clears throat> so then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. 
and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in, un in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand to sing the Alleluia. <laughs> gospel for this morning is Luke chapter 11 verses 1 to 13. These words will be the basis for Vicar's sermon in a few moments. We read, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not give up, get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. The children can come to the chancel steps for a brief children's message. guys to, to just think about the times that you've asked your parents for something. Does that ever happen? You ever ask your parents for something? Maybe once in a while? Yeah? Have you always gotten exactly what you've asked for? No? Probably not? Yeah, in, in fact, sometimes when we pray to God, too, we, we don't get exactly what we ask for. But just like your parents, they do hear you when you ask for something, and you know, they probably teach you some things when they say no too, don't they? They might say, well, I don't know if you need that, and here's why. Or you might just get into a conversation about that thing, and you might not get it in the end, but you learn something. And that's what we're going to learn today in the sermon, is that God promises always to answer us, 
even if he doesn't say yes or no, all our prayers, though, are always effective and always matter. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord, help us to utilize this wonderful gift of prayer and know that it is always effective and useful and beneficial for us, even when your answer isn't what we'd expect or what we'd think. Amen. Day we have the nursery, but no kids' church day. So, I'm going to head back. All right, for the rest of us here, we will sing hymn 411. What a friend we have in Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our sermon text today is Luke 11, the first 13 verses, and let's begin fittingly with a prayer. Oh Lord, please teach us what you would have us learn about the great gift of prayer. Help us to value this gift and to, to use it more than we ever have. In your name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Growing up in, in school, I had a lot of classes where a ton of information was just thrown at me. That it was just a bunch of information that came at me, and it was hard to, to grab hold of a lot of it. It was hard to make anything stick. And I, I've come to realize, too, that the ones that I did learn, those concepts that I, that I took to heart, were the ones that I could see displayed in my life somehow. And I, I came to a greater understanding of those than just simply reading and memorizing and reciting facts. It, it, we as humans aren't just heads on sticks. We aren't just things that think. Uh, we, are, we are souls. We have experiences and, and emotions, and we don't just learn through a lot of information. Today we are going to learn about prayer, and Jesus is our teacher. And he doesn't 
teach us by throwing information at us. He doesn't give us five easy steps to a better prayer life. Today, Jesus wants to show us from our own experiences how effective prayer really is. And we have 13 verses here. I'm, I'm going to, there's so much I could say about this, but I'm going to try to keep myself to that one point. And God bless us as we learn from our Savior. Jesus opens up chapter 11, um, Luke, sorry, opens up chapter 11 by saying, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. That sounds pretty vague. It is. Um, the day, one day, and the location, a certain place, are purposefully vague because Luke just wants us to know that Jesus was praying. In fact, this was a big part of the whole gospel of Luke. This is the seventh time already that Luke has mentioned Jesus praying. In chapter 6, he told us that Jesus prayed throughout the entire night. Luke wants us to know that prayer was a big part of Jesus' life. And no one knew that better than the 12 disciples who lived with him. And in fact, it seems like as they saw him pray so much, they began to think, man, I wonder if I'm doing something wrong. I wonder if I'm missing something, because he sure seems to be getting a lot out of it. And we find out that one of his disciples came up to him and asked, Lord, teach us how to pray. And, and what a fitting prayer that is for us this morning. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Here Jesus teaches us the Lord's Prayer. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's not quite the one we usually say. There, there's another one that Jesus, another time in his ministry when Jesus said the Lord's Prayer, and that's given to us in Matthew in, in a little bit fuller way. And I think that Jesus did this on purpose. He maybe didn't say the exact words every time because he didn't want his disciples just to think, oh, this is the magic formula. This is, these are the exact words to say every time we pray. And Jesus wanted them to learn about prayer from their own experience. He didn't want them just to recite some words, go through the motions. And that's why he jumps into this, this interesting parable of sorts. He said, suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. I'm going to stop right there. This Maybe it seems kind of crazy. Someone showing up at your house in the middle of the night, unannounced. But to people in Jesus' day, that this wasn't as, as odd. It was more ordinary than we'd think. A lot of times, to avoid the extreme heat of the day, people would walk and travel in the night. And they didn't have any phones to text ahead and tell them when they were going to get there. So sometimes they would just show up. And if you didn't have any bread on hand, you'd have to get it from somewhere else, like a friend or a neighbor. Uh, this friend or neighbor said, don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Then Jesus says, I tell you, though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. The man says that he is in bed with his children. A lot of these houses were simply one room with a roof on top. So if one person gets up, everybody gets up. And that's why Jesus rightly says, even if this guy wouldn't get up in the middle of the night to give you these things because you're his friend, if you are shamelessly knocking on his door, he will get up to give you the bread because he needs to get your, he needs to get your kids back to sleep. <laughs> this is a, it's an interesting parable. Jesus teaches his disciples to pray by speaking of this almost seemingly rude person who shamelessly knocks on someone's door in the middle of the night. And the reason they do it isn't because they have to. Their, their guests probably weren't going to starve to death. But because they knew it would work. They knew that when they knocked, the door would be open. And Jesus reiterates this meaning with famous words in verses 9 and 10. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and 
you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Jesus says that's the secret to prayer. Not the correct words, not, not the right length. Nothing else. Simply believing that it works. Simply knowing that when you ask, you will receive. Simply knowing that when you seek, you, you will find. And if you do not, God, your heavenly Father, will answer your prayer. He will open the door. That is first and foremost what prayer is all about. Seems like the disciples thought it was about all these different things and, and they were wondering, am I missing something? Maybe I'm doing something wrong. And, and I, I, I don't know about you, but I can relate to that thought pretty well. I mean, as Christians, we know we, know we are to pray. We believe in God. We love him. And, and, but it seems like this, this prayer thing, yeah, we know it's good to do, but when, when are the usual times we pray? Before meals, right? And at bedtime, usually. But a lot of times that can become more habitual than heartfelt. And maybe sometimes we, we pray here in church or we pray before a big event, but a lot of times that's kind of what we do because, you know, we're Christians. We know we should pray before these types of things. That's what we do. Or, or the sometime, sometimes we pray when we're in great need, great distress, after every other possibility of has been exhausted. We finally cry, Lord, save me. I mean, it can't hurt, right? It seems like we, we mainly pray either out of habit, out of a sense of duty, or as a last resort, none of which really display great trust in the efficacy of prayer. I think, I think there may be many reasons why we don't pray as much as we'd like, but I think that's, that's really what it comes down to. We don't understand exactly how it works or if it works. Maybe we think, oh, well, God is in control of everything and, and he knows what is best. So he will do that no, ma no, matter what, no matter what I do. Or we think, yes, you know, I'd like to talk to God about some of my things, but he's, you know, ruling the universe, probably got bigger things on his plate than small trivial matters in my life. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd say I'd say thank you to God more often, but I know he's going to give me what he's going to give me, regardless of what I say after. Just like those disciples, sometimes we just don't get it. And Jesus says, ask and you will receive. Jesus says, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. And we say, well, Lord, I, I've been knocking and I don't think the door was open. Sometimes I seek and I don't think I'm finding. I don't think that my experience really shows this to be true. But this morning, Jesus argues the exact opposite. Did you hear his parable? It was about someone's experience, someone's everyday experience. What Jesus is saying is that the effectiveness of prayer for a Christian shouldn't be more of a problem than really the effectiveness of any human action. I suppose, you know, it's raining this morning. I suppose some of you saw your umbrella near the door and said, well, you know, if it is God's will that I should be wet or dry, you know, he will allow the raindrops to part and fall around me, so I'm not going to take my umbrella this morning. Or I suppose none of us have ever asked someone to pass the salt because God knows best whether or not I should have salt. It'll just appear. I mean, some, some people might call that great faith. I think God would laugh and say that's what the salt's on the table for. You know, we, we act like God allows us to change the course of events in our life. That's how we operate. And, and, and if he allows us, I mean, it's, the crazy thing is that he allows us to do, to have that free will and to change things. But if he allows us to do it in one way, why also when he allow us to do it in another way, especially when that other way, prayer, is through his wisdom and power. Pascal, a, a mathematician and Christian philosopher, once wrote, God instituted prayer to communicate to his creatures the 
dignity of causality. And what, what he's getting at there is God didn't make a bunch of robots. He made living and breathing people. He wants to have a relationship with each and every one of us. And, and besides the usual ways that he allows us to exercise our free will, he gives his children a special blessing. Treats us with dignity by saying that he will answer our prayers. Yeah, it might be yes, it might be, it might be no, but he promises that prayer is effective, that it works. You might say, well, if God is in control of everything, then he knows when I'm going to pray and he knows already what he's going to give me. But that doesn't mean that prayer doesn't matter. Think about this God also knows the times when you didn't pray and what he would have blessed you with if you had only asked. In the end, prayer isn't just about getting what we want. That there's so much more to it than that. Think about, think about Jesus himself, just how much he prayed. And Jesus was God. He, he understood the plan. He, he knew where things were headed. And yet, he prayed more, more than any of his disciples, more, more than anyone. There must be something more to this prayer. But what really gets me is that Jesus prayed to God even when he knew the answer would be no. Remember in that Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prays three times that the Lord would take that bitter cup of death from him? Three times he prayed, and yet when he ended, he knew that he was going to have to drink it. There must be something more to prayer than simply getting yes. And, and who could say that that was the wrong answer when we stand looking forward to heaven because of it? When we stand on the other side of the cross thinking of the blessings and, and, and the peace that we have because God said no to Jesus and in turn said yes to us. And, and even then, Jesus was denied in his prayer, but an angel was sent to strengthen him. You never know the good the good and the blessings that can come through prayer. God just wants us to talk to him as our father. And that's, that's what Jesus explains in the last few verses of our text today. Which of, your, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, evil here meaning sinful, not that we're you know, scheming against our kids. If you, though, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Now when I first read this, I see there these kids ask for an egg and a fish. Kind of, I don't know if that, I don't know if those are sinful foolish gifts for the time, but I, I have a lot of higher expectations at Christmas time than an egg and a fish. Um, and I think these, these might be kind of foolish gifts. These might be just things that kids want. I, I don't know where I would be today if my parents gave me everything I asked for. Or, more importantly, if God had said yes to every prayer I had asked. I probably wouldn't be in this pulpit. And just, Jesus, Jesus says, parents won't say yes to their children every time. They know how to handle their kids. And they teach them probably more sometimes through saying no. And, and the same is with God, our Father. He knows how to handle us as his children. And he does so in a perfect way, in a way that is without sin at all. God knows how to give good gifts to his children. You notice that Jesus didn't say, ask and you will receive the answer you asked for. Ask and you, um, seek and you will find what you're looking for. Knock and the door will be opened and inside will be what you asked for. He said, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find something. Knock and the door will be opened by your father. It might be yes. Often God does answer our prayer might be no, it might be something else, but in all this, we have the confidence that we will receive, that our Father will answer. And 
then Jesus gives us one more amazing blessing here. He says, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? See what he did there? He gave us a guaranteed yes. If you ask for the Holy Spirit, God will give it to you. What is the Holy Spirit? Well, he, he comes and he works in your heart, and he will start to produce the fruits of his Spirit. And those fruits are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are some wonderful gifts. Amazing gifts. My friends, there's so much more to say about this section of Scripture. Um, we could talk about how to pray boldly and consistently. We could talk about uh, the benefits of prayer, how even secular people see the benefit of meditating daily, not, not to mention talking to God himself. We could talk about uh, the blessing of praying for others and how we can help them in unimaginable ways through God's power and become more selfless at the same time. We could talk about the, the humility that comes with confession. We could talk about how joy walks hand in hand with giving thanks to God. I could go on and on, but for today, let's just focus on that one point. Prayer is effective. Ask and you will receive. And really, I can only explain it so much. You have to just, you have to do it. You have to pray. Maybe, maybe it's just five minutes in the morning. Set a timer if you need to. Pretty soon you'll probably find out you need to lengthen it to ten minutes. And it'll go from there. A friend of mine in our congregation here says that he sets a notification on his phone to tell him to pray at different times throughout the day. It's a great idea. But whatever it is, you have to actually pray to God on you don't have to say eloquent words. You don't have to pray for a long time. You don't even have to clean up your act. Jesus already took care of that. You simply knock on the door, and when your father opens, you go inside and you sit down and talk to him. And if you ask for the Holy Spirit, he promises to give it to you. Lord, teach us how to pray. Amen. Please stand. Peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. We'll continue on page three with our responses. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered as Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. God has given us this ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, let us be reconciled to God and to one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. Uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, offerings may be given, and uh, the friendship registers will be passed up.
stand for prayer. We pray, dear Father, we boldly come before you as your children. We know that these prayers we offer are effective, that you will always answer us according to your good and gracious will. We pray to you, Father, for the gift of the Holy Spirit, that the fruits of faith might be shown in our lives, and that all who know us might see your presence in us. Create also in us the interceding heart of Christ, that we might join in his prayer for the world, asking that all might come to repentance and be saved. We pray to you, Father, for our synod, that we may not be taken captive by modern philosophy and the empty deceit of this world. Let us cling to your word and not be pulled away by the temptation of earthly approval and popularity. Guard us from all error in Christ's word, and let us be faithful to him as his bride, the church. We pray to you, Father, for those who suffer with illness. This morning, in particular, for our sister, Judy Nicholsburg, that she would recover from surgery and regain her strength. There are many more on our hearts and minds that we are also concerned for. We ask that you would sustain them in faith in their hour of trial and grant them help and healing through the doctors and medical staff you have provided for their care. Finally, we pray for confidence as we come to your table this morning, that we might approach in certain faith to receive Christ's bo true body and blood in this sacrament. Into your hands, dear Father, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated. I invite those assisting with distribution to come forward, as well as the ushers to come forward. Follow the ushers' directions. God bless your community.
Let's stand for closing prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for nourishing us in this sacrament with your body and blood. You've given us forgiveness, life, and salvation. Let us always remain in you as branches remain in the vine. Send us out now in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. standing to sing the final hymn, which is this morning, 412. May be seated. Thank you for coming out to worship this morning. I've uh, been asked to uh, underscore the announcement about next Sunday's Michigan adventure trip for the uh, teens of the congregation. That'd be those entering eighth grade through twelfth grade. Um, that'll be next Sunday after this service to plan to depart. Um, looks like that we have twenty-five teens and chaperones. Uh, it could be adults as well. You'll get a group discount. I think there's a little more information about price in the bulletin. You can bring friends along with you, provided that they listen to Vicar and behave. <laughs> uh, contact Vicar as soon as possible. He'd like to order the tickets on Tuesday. Received a letter today, or really uh, sometime this week or the end of this week, from uh, Pastor Schmoller. I'd like to you indulge me, read it to you. It's uh, his decision about uh, serving us. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, allow me to express my gratitude for the countless number of prayers that I have been offered to our Lord during these last weeks as I contemplated the two calls I currently hold. I appreciated the people who took time to email and speak with me and share their thoughts. Through this calling process, he has led me to catch a glimpse of the great blessings and opportunities that his gospel work is producing in two corners of the visible church at the same time. That is a rare and tremendous blessing, one that has produced in me a deep awe and appreciation for his work in both Rockford and Lafayette. I have given serious and prayerful deliberation to the call extended to me to serve as associate pastor at Christ our Savior Lutheran in Rockford. It has been a difficult process, but one through which the Lord has greatly blessed my family and me. I wrestled with the Lord's call. In the end, however, I am asked to choose between two blessings. 
After much prayerful consideration and contemplating the needs of both churches, I've decided to continue serving as pastor at Lamb of God Lutheran Church in Lafayette, Indiana. I pray that the Lord would continue to bless our ministry, although separated by many miles, still united in faith and mission, as we share the gospel of our Savior to those within our congregations and communities. I also pray that at the right time, God will send a pastor to Christ our Savior. May the Lord continue to bless us as we work in his kingdom. In Christ's service, Pastor Nicholas Schmoll. So, if you didn't catch it, that means he's declined his, uh, our call to come serve us. Um, in keeping with Vicar's uh, sermon, apparently he was not an egg. He might have been like a scorpion or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I'm not going to, I mean, if, if we have uh, several, God willing, we won't have several declinations. I don't know if I would always read the letter after church, decide to post it on the bulletin board and link it, but I thought that uh, Pastor Schmoller um, wrote a wonderful letter expressing a lot of the thoughts that pastors have in their hearts and their calling. Truly a shame. It really is. And, and uh, so I kind of share that with you uh, uh, as well. So as we explain in this calling process of men who are currently serving in other churches, what happens next is another call meeting. One's already been scheduled in conjunction with our district leadership, and a call list is being prepared. It's scheduled for 7.30 on Tuesday, August 2nd. It immediately follows an elder meeting, a board of elder meeting, that will be held at 6.30. One of the items on their agenda that night will be to go over the call list and discuss it thoroughly. And perhaps, we don't know if that would be the case, but perhaps they might even have some recommendations as to which ones on the list they favor, even though all of them are certainly qualified. Um, so that will be, you're invited to that, of course, at 7.30 on Tuesday, August 2nd. So let uh, Victor and I get to the back door. We'll shake your hand. And uh, looks like I talked long enough. The rain has stopped. And we'll see you next week when the time.